For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. see in verse 1 this is the book of the generations of Adam that word generation is where we get that word Toledo see yours could say generations it could say genealogy um, I forget but this is the word in um, this translation it's the word generations yours might say genealogy uh, and this is one of the great genealogies uh, of the, um, this is a genealogy of the first half of the Gentile age. The Sethites uh, in the Gentile age, which goes from Adam to Abraham, the first half of that is the Sethites, and the second half is the Shemites in that. And so this is, uh, and uh, the only place you can find this historical record is the Bible. Um, and what is, so um, Genesis 5 is very important because it's the only historical record we have of these people. And, um, you know, if you don't believe in the Bible, even as a historical book, then this, uh, this, is, a whole ge this is a whole civilization of people that nobody, nobody knows about unless you study the Bible. And so this goes... This is from the fall of man after after uh, he's out of the garden, right? He's left the garden. We're in chapter 4. Now we're in chapter 5, and we have this genealogy, and this is the Sethite history. And um, so in verse 1, this is how it's identified. And this, and I just want you to follow with me. We're, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I'm going to study on it, but the genealogy are 10... Ten, there, are ten, there are 10 people listed if you're in Genesis 5. Once you start with verse 3, you know, you got Adam, then you got Seth, and the whole list goes on. And if you count them, you're going to wind up with 10. All the way to Noah. From Adam to Noah is going to be 10. All right, so that's chapter 5. See, the genealogy. But this goes, this Taladoth 1 goes into the 6th chapter, verses 1 through 8, and um, this is going to show you in that section, it's going to do a synopsis on what led to the great flood and the destruction and God destroying the antediluvian, uh, this part of the antediluvian world, okay? So that's, so verses one th six chapter one through eight is a very important, and it's kind of like a bridge into the third Taladoth, which picks up this at at six nine, and goes through the end of chapter nine. So it the third Taladoth picks up at six nine and goes through the end of the ninth chapter, which is uh, the whole discussion of the flood and the ark, and it comes to a rest and it, all of that. So. The corruption of mankind as a civilization, not the fall of Adam, but the corruption of, the, of a civilization of, of mankind is discussed. And the, it, the whole discussion in, in uh, Toledoth 2 as, as a bridge sentence is what was the cause. And we'll talk about that, but not tonight. We're going to look at the genealogy. The other thing about a genealogy, a Hebrew genealogy, is names are very important. They give you a look into the prophetic history of a person and his ministry. A person. And in the case of a genealogy, it takes you into the history 
of uh, uh, not only the history of a person, like in this case, but that person represents a section of that history. Do you understand? So when you've got when you've got ten of these in this first section of the what we call the Gentile dispensation of the antediluvian civilization, the names of these people are very important. They have a, a prophetic attach to the plan of God. And so what you have is you have seven while well, you have seven families and people, they're also sections of history of the antediluvian world. So that makes it kind of really interesting as far as, as far as history. And so the names of Hebrew people connected with the plan of God in their historical period of time is very important. And, and of course, this period of time is, you know, uh, people are living eight, eight and nine hundred years. Um, Noah lived Noah lived nine hundred to be nine hundred and fifty. And of course Methuselah, he's the most famous guy that came out of this troop, lived uh, nine hundred and sixty nine years. So just in case you think you're getting old. Uh, so uh, let's have a word of prayer and then I want to look at the 10 sections of human history by the names of the people and we'll, we'll try to take a look at that and take a look at some of the things and what led up uh, to, the, to the destruction of an entire human civilization. Let's pray. I'll give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin. Why, why would I need to do that? Well, in carnality, you can't study the Bible and get spiritual information. You have to be a spiritual person under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You have to be saved. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's the gospel. And the gospel, when you believe it, is the power of your salvation. Romans 1.16. So, uh, how do I identify carnality? Well, personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or bird sins. These should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study so the Holy Spirit can minister the truth of the Word of God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Well, Father, we are thankful for these that have come our way both by automobile and by Internet. I pray, Father, that we would use classroom etiquette not be distracted from the hour of study the Holy Spirit might become the great teacher of the human spirit on truth as we look here tonight Father at the a section of the Gentile age of, of ten generations of the Sethite history pray Father we would see and, and what caused God to destroy an entire civilization of mankind and uh, we, we will certainly look at that over the process of our studies but we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so there are ten, when you look through this, there are ten, um, there are ten people or ten sections of history that cover this period. And we're going to look, we're going to divide these ten into two periods of five each. And the reason is because you can see it when I lay this out, you'll see how important the first five and the second five were. And the second five is going to, going to show you exactly the steps within the civilization that led to total destruction. It's, it's going to begin in the sixth generation, and the tenth, by the tenth generation, they're going to be done. And so we're going, to, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the first five. And then we're, we're going we're gonna to see what was going on. Then we're going to see what happened in the second as we go through this tonight. So I want you to be aware of that. In this period of time of the antediluvian prior to the flood, there were actually three races of humans. There was the Canaanites. There were the Sethites. And then there's going to be the Nephilims. And um, 
the only one that's going to come out of that, scripturally, the only one that's going to come out of that is the Sethites. And the only Sethites that's going to come out of that is one family, and that's the family of Noah that consisted of Noah and his wife and three married sons. That's pretty serious. That's a pretty serious flood, isn't it? Um, so we'll, this, is the peer, this is what's going on that brought that about it, these ten generations. Um, now, one of the things I hear a great deal when I teach is, and I'll get a lot of this off from Internet. Are you telling me, Ron? Because I would tell you what I read. I, I read the Word of God. All I can do is tell you the Word of God. I, I don't sit in personal counsel with God and, and get all this stuff. Um, he don't sit down with me and say, should I destroy all these people or whatever. But here's what I get. Ron, are you telling me that out of this entire civilization of people, and there, there were apparently many, you know, we're talking millions of people, that we only got eight people on a boat that survived, and God is going to start a whole nother civilization with eight people. And by the time we get to Abraham, another ten generations of people. Uh, we're going to have this whole thing repopulated. Well, that's what the Bible says. Now, what do I know? That's what the Bible says. They say, do you, do you understand how stupid that sounds? I say, well, yeah, I know. But let me tell you something. He only started with two people to get where he is. <laughs> so... Stupid is how I've been studying the Bible. I mean, this whole thing started with Adam and Eve. And by the time we get to flood, we got, we got millions of people. So they really took this thing serious about copulation and multiplication. But, yeah, so I think we're pretty much far ahead when I got eight people on a boat. <laughs> and they're all able to have kids. I think we're doing pretty good. I mean, yeah. Because I read in the Bible where God says, look, I'm going to destroy all these people. And Moses says, oh, no, 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 wait. And he goes, look, that's not a problem. I can raise it. I can raise Listen, look, gather a bunch of rocks up, as many rocks as you find. I can make people out of them. So I guess, I guess that's not a big deal for God. But anyhow, I, I get this a lot, so please don't, for those who might be coming down on the internet, I'm giving you all I know, okay? I just know we started with two, now we got eight. So if you wind up in a flood and there's only you and another person, unless it's another per well, anyhow, you, you, <laughs> might, you might be all right, just depending on who that other person is, okay? But, but look. When, look, in my, in my post-Diluvian period of history, when God, when God sent Gabriel to Mary and says to Mary, you're going to have a baby. And say, oh, oh I, when I get married, I am, yeah. I'm looking forward to having a baby with Joseph. Oh, you're going to have a baby before you ever get married. Oh, I don't think so now. Now, that, uh, I don't, your name may get, be Gabriel, it may not be. Because you're talking foolishness to me. You're talking foolishness because that's not going to happen. Listen. I got my man and my man ain't got there. There ain't nobody else getting there. So, he says, well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're, this is what's going to happen. And he goes over that explanation to it. And I want you to look at Luke with me. I know you know this, but it, it does good to look at the word. Luke 1, Luke 130, I don't know, probably 37, 38. 137. So 
you know, when God, did, listen, and I'm telling you this because it gets, listen, there, there are times in our life where we come to places that are impossible from a human perspective. Agreed? I mean, Lazarus is dead three days, and fourth, he's going to stink. I mean, we can, there are things that we enter into from a human realm are absolutely impossible. Would you agree with that? And some, some are more impossible based on the way they shrink the world than other people. Agree? But listen, we all are going to have those moments when we're in impossible circumstances. They're just impossible. Okay. And so there's a word for you. There is a word from the Lord to you. Listen to what he says in verse 37. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. She said, well, this is an impossibility. He says, no, it's not going to be an impossibility because God has set this program up and he, the Holy Spirit is, is going to plant the seed in you and the baby's going to come and this baby's going to be the son of God. But he says, for nothing, nothing. Now, when you got nothing, you know what I mean? There have been times in our life when we've been at nothing, right? And that's the kind of way you're going to wind up at the end. If you don't, if you don't have God, you still got nothing. But if you have God, you're naked and die. You die naked. You don't have anything from the world, but you got everything for the next one. Hello? Because you can't take anything. I mean, you can't load up a U-Haul it and come out. It, it, that's not the way it works. But you can lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Maybe depend on how big a place we get when we get there. Right? All the trophies we've got. We've got a whole room of tro trophies. Say, well, how did you get three bedrooms? Well, it, it, I got crowns and all that, and one takes up one by itself. Well, anyhow, nothing for nothing will be impossible with God. With God, so you see how important the Word of God is. But how do I know what's what's impossible and not with God? His Word. Like in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me, and I know he hears me, I get the, yeah, according to his will. Nothing's impossible according to his will. If he, once he lays his will on you through the word of God, there is nothing impossible. So, you know, the Hortonism, what is that? He may be, yeah. may make you wait, but he's never late. And there's always good reasons. You don't want whatever you think you want and you have the right to ask for. Be sure that he's more willing to give it to you than your heart could desire it. But listen, he wants, it, he wants you to be able to appreciate it fully once he gives it to you. I mean, what parent doesn't do that? What good parent does not do that? Well, now, do you have a study Bible? I know, I've got, got one coming for you. Tell you the truth, I had one. You skipped, a, you skipped a couple Sundays, and I gave it to somebody else. I gave it to somebody else who needed it, and so I've ordered you another one. It's coming now. But I know you have. I'm not picking on you. I'm just telling you why you didn't have the Bible. <laughs> not trying to pick on you. God knows I still got empty chains at chairs in here. I don't need to be picking on anybody, do I? Uh, nothing's a positive. Do you have a study Bible? Okay, if you have a study Bible, look in the look in verse for verse 37. You got Genesis 18, 14. Well, you got other ones, but that's a good one. And and they're going to put the ones that he, they suggest you look at first first. So 
in Genesis, which is our book, but not the place where we are, but it's in our book, you'll recall that if, you, if, if, if you're a student around here, then you know Genesis 18 is really important. This is Abraham and Sarah time. And so we know that chapter 18 is a big deal. So when I saw chapter 18, I went, oh, I know what this is about. And so I looked at verse 14. And it says, you know, the Lord comes to Abraham. He's 100, Sarah's 90, or he's, a, he's 99, and she's a 90 or whatever it is. He says, you're going to have a ba baby, and he goes like, oh, yeah, right. I've been waiting, you know, I've been waiting on this promise to be fulfilled for 25 years. You told me that, you told me that 25 years ago when it was actually possible. Huh? But now, of course, it's impossible. And Sarah's sitting at the gate, at the tent door uh, listening. She didn't have Facebook yet. <laughs> so that's her Facebook. She goes like, well, he's finally got, he's finally said something sensible. Because <laughs> that sure is impossible. And so she had a good laugh about it. And he said, Sarah, come out from behind that curtain there. You're going to have this baby next year at this time. Then she really had a good laugh. Verse 14, verse 14, 18, 14. Lord said to, in verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, I shall, <laughs> shall I indeed bear a child when I'm so old? See, sometimes God waits till it's uncomfortable for you, doesn't he? Huh? But you know, not only did they have that baby, they absolutely was able to raise it. Now, sure, they were the oldest people at kindergarten parties and things. When they were at the PTAs, they, they looked like great-grandparents. But you know what? They both lived to raise that child to a full-grown, mature man in the Lord. Well, anyhow, it says... Uh, the Lord says to Abraham, oh, see, Sarah's getting a good, uh, apparently she thinks I'm funny. She's got a real, listen, I hadn't seen Sarah laugh that much in a pretty good while. Yeah. Hmm. And then it says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? See, is anything, is anything too difficult? Well, for them, it's impossible, not difficult. It's way beyond difficult. This is impossible. Impossible is a little further down the road than difficult, isn't it? Yeah. At the appointed time, I'll return to you, and next year, I'll have the laugh. <laughs> Sarah screaming in the tent, get this baby out. <laughs> yeah. Well, before you think this is impossible, and, and when you get to that place in your life where you feel that what you're about to face and have to sign off on is impossible, you be sure, you be sure this one thing, that you go to the Bible and find out what the Bible says. Because if the Bible says that's a go, then you can be sure that nothing's impossible with the Lord. Therefore, you can turn loose of your responsibility and turn it over to the Lord because the Lord will do what he promised. That's Romans 4.21. He is, he is able and willing to do what he promised. And listen, you've probably gone through these experiences in your life already, you know, to some degree. So, look, is anything... Is anything too difficult? No. See, difficult puts it on us. Impossible puts it on him. And those things that are impossible, even those things who are that will be difficult, I mean, well, I don't think I even want this promise now. Right? 
That's difficult. Why do you want it now? You've been, you've been whining and crying and begging. I'm going to give it to you now because you got the maturity to handle it. The maturity. I make a list in the morning and forgot what I made the list about. I can be on. I can be on a phone call right now. So put the phone up, walk in the other room, and forget who called and what it was about. Difficult. Well, anyhow, I'm just. I'm just trying to tell you that. Nothing's impossible with God. And nothing, listen, that's on his part. That's his deal. And nothing's too difficult for you on your part because God can do what he says. And he will do what he's promised to your life. You can put that in the bank, as they say. Well, we're going to look at each of the ten people tonight and give them a synoptic look, just a, a preview of their life uh, that comes out of the genealogy. Um, one of the things I want you to look for tonight, uh, one of the, th here's what's interesting about this genealogy, ab about the Sethite history. It counts backwards and forwards from the birth of a generation. You with me? Counts back and counts forward from the birth of a generation. That's a firstborn. That's a firstborn of a generation. That's really important that you know that because that's not normal. That's not normally how we do that. But th this is important that you get that. Also, when you look at the first five, when you look at this, there's going to be a standard certification. You're going to have a birth. You're going to have a birth certificate, certification. You're going to have a genealogy. A, fa a genealogy family certificate, and you can have a death certificate. Those three things are going to be consistent, and when they're not, you really pay attention because these should be always be there. And if they're not there, something bigs up. Are you with me? Because not all of them have them. That means what? Something bigs up. Come on now. Well, this is not my test. All right? So you're going to have to, you're going to always have a birth certificate, a genealogy certificate, you know, the birth of the boy, and that's the family heritage, and the death certificate. Now, it starts right out. Adam, right? First guy up is Adam. He does have a birth certificate. Why? Because he was created. He was Barah, not, La, not Yalad. Remember, Yalad is the word for birth. Barah is creation. And, and how did he make him? Out of dirt. Was not a nothing. Made him out of dirt. Made him out of the ground. So his, the name Adam means ground. And, and what's interesting about it, he made him out of the ground. After he fell, he said, and he'll return to the ground. Okay? And we all do because we die. We all Unless a rapture comes, we all die. And we do there, but it's different. Um, so now there's no, with Enoch, everybody knows this now, but with Enoch, there's no death certificate. He was not. He was, he was took up by the Lord. Right? So there's no. And what's interesting, in Toledoth 2, in this genealogy, and in all of Toledoth 2, there's no death certificate for Noah. You're not going to get a death certificate for Noah until you get into the Toledoth 3. That makes Noah's unusual. Also what's going to be unusual for Noah, everybody else gets a firstborn except him. Noah, there's no firstborn son in that, but rather all three sons are identified. All three sons are given... Uh, the genealogy record, which is really interesting. And that's going to come back again to us after the flood. And these three guys are going to have a genealogy listing. And God is going to select one of the sons to carry the messianic lineage. So this makes it really interesting. <laughs> that's a wish on my end, isn't it? 
I, this makes it really interesting. That's just a, a real hope on my end, I guess. Now, the first five, Adam, his name means ground, or that's f because he came from there. No birth, there is no birth certificate with him because he wasn't born, he was created. Um, I'll tell you something else that's interesting. I don't know if I said this about him. Maybe I didn't say this. I guess I didn't. But you know what's interesting about Adam? He's never called Adam until um, well, I'm out of my book. I, uh, did, I didn't write this down anywhere but he's not called Adam until after the fall and maybe maybe this is the first time that he's called Adam um, wait let me see about him getting married could be in the second chapter let me look at the second chapter a moment I meant to write this down uh, Adam see he's called man he's called man in the English he's called man every time now um, the man this this Bible stays with the word man and then the third chapter just flash through there oh I got, I got him in this Bible I got him in the third chapter verse 17 that's after the fall and after the judgment third chapter verse 17 you remember that this, this is uh, then Adam and then to Adam he said He's called man all the way up to that time. And now after that, he's going to be called Adam. He's called man. That's the first time he's referred to as Adam. And in this genealogy, he's referred to Adam. That's just a kind, it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, we have studied through these Genesis passages, and that it's just interesting to me. Um, okay, now Seth, uh, his name means the appointed one. The appointed one. And that's because, you know, uh, Cain kills Abel, and then he's excommunicated, and so he's sent off. He can't be a part of it. And then God gives them Seth as the appointed one of the Messianic lineage. He becomes, he's the third child, because, but he becomes the firstborn, which is really interesting. He's the third child, but he becomes the firstborn because one has been killed and the other has been excommunicated he's been punished as he's sent off can't be a part of him um, he's the first to be given a, a birth genealogy in the lineage of Christ and look he shows up in Luke look just quickly look over in Luke the third chapter I know we've seen this many times but there may be somebody who hasn't in Luke the third chapter uh, and the very last verse, and he's dealing with the genealogy, the messianic genealogy from Jesus in verse 23 all the way back to Adam. So in verse 23, we have the last Adam of 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And in 38, we have the first Adam. Um, oh, gosh, I lost my place. Um, Adam, I mean, Luke 3, 38, see that? Um, and it says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. See? And so we got Seth. He is the first in the lineage of Christ. Well, it, of course. It, look, you know what's... It, it, um, now, no, you say, well, I think Adam is. Well, Adam is, but this is the first birth certificate. Adam don't have a birth certificate. See? So this makes this very important with his name, the appointed one. And the ground with Adam, his name Adam with the word ground makes it important because he doesn't have a birth certificate. He has a creation certificate. <laughs> I think that might, that might trump, I don't know. Uh, it might trump a birth certificate. I don't know. Um, uh, I hadn't even thought about that until it came out of my mouth that it was, that it was Trump. Um, uh, 
but Seth. So he's the first to be given, and this is kind of important. That's why he's the appointed one. He is the first of a, uh, that has a birth certificate of a genealogy in the lineage of Christ, and Luke shows that. Luke shows that. Now, Enosh, the word Enosh in Hebrew, and that it means mortal man, and you can read about him in verses 9 through 11. Uh, but he's introduced. Oh, I can't, lost my place again. He's introduced in the fourth chapter. Um, kind of interesting. Let's see, fourth chapter. See, I'm in the fifth chapter uh, in the genealogy. Um, fourth chapter. Oh, yeah. See, verse 26. Look at the fourth chapter, verse 26. He's mentioned before the genealogy. The, the, he was mentioned before the genealogy, which is kind of unique uh, about this. And it says, and that's the son of Seth. Uh, Enosh is the son of Seth. And it says, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that's really important. One, we got Seth is the first first birth generation of the line of Christ. In the very second line, you have Enosh, mortal man, and it is at this period of history that men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of dispute about that. Do they think, is, is this about prayer? Mm. Look, at they've been praying. They prayed in the garden. They, I mean, prayer is nothing new to them. It's sacrifice is nothing new to them. Um, Men began to camp. I think I think it's a reference to Romans ten thirteen, which is a reference to the old covenant. I I think what actually began in this point is evangelism. I think evangelism. I think Enosh, as mortal man, came to realize that mortal man had to be saved. And and God introduced evangelism. Uh, because. In Romans 10, 13, it uses something very similar to this. And remember, this is a Hebraic phrase. This is a Hebraic phrase. In, in Genesis 4, 23, these men begin, then men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. That's a Hebraic. In Romans 10, 13, that's also Hebraic. When it says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I, th I personally think that's the same deal. And, I, and I'll tell you why. It's because in Second Peter, in Second Peter, the second chapter, verse 5, it talks about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. And I think this whole thing uh, became a spiritual movement uh, with Enosh. Okay? Then Kenan, now we have a problem here in translation. Um, that's a Q, but you remember in Old Hebrew, in Old Hebrew they put it a K, that's how you got a K here, K E N A N. See, we call that's a Q actually, but old Hebrew they did it and put a dot under it. Uh, that and that's the way I was taught, and so a lot of times I I put a K with this stuff too. Uh, that's a K. And there's your E. Uh, I think that's K E. Yeah, E N A N. Q-E-N-A-N. -N. And uh, that's the reason they did it, K, but uh, K-E-N-A-N, -A -N, uh, Q, see, Q. But they put it a K. Now, here's what's interesting about this. And, and this is what the Hebrew says. This is what the Hebrew says. The Septuagint. But let me show you something. Go, go back. I'm going to take this thing right here. Put that there. Go back to Luke with me a moment. I want to show you something. And, and I'll show you where they got this. 
the average person they don't they don't care about all this it takes <coughs> it takes somebody like me just to be a little weird but I studied genealogy of Christ a great deal the New Testament genealogy so I run across all the stuff and then when I do that I got to run it down look at verse 37 we're running this see we was in 38 we got God Adam Seth Enosh now look what, what, look what you got there C-A-I-N-A-N Canaan that ain't even near our Hebrew idea so where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. This is what you always do when you run into something like this. You go like, whoa. That's not, that's not in the ballpark. Where'd that come from? That's not in the Hebrew text. Where'd that come from? And I'll tell you where it came from. Where do you think it came from? So it came from the Septuagint. It came from the Septuagint of this very verse. That where we are in Hebrews. And therefore, it got translated that way into uh, the New Testament because that was their Bible. You understand that? That was their Bible. That's, most of them were Greek-speaking, and that's where it came from. That's where it came from. Uh, so there is, a, there is some confusion about that. But in the Hebrew, there isn't. But it, it does change what is going on here. Okay? It does change what's going on here. In the Hebrew, the word kenan, Kenan or Cunan means to acquire wisdom. And that's actually what the, what the Hebrew says. Whereas the word Canaan comes after Cain means spear. So there, historically, this is a big difference. We understand this is, this is a big difference. But the Hebrew makes it very clear. And I think what you have is you have Adam, then you have Seth. We got the, now we're ready to go. We've got regeneration on the move through natural birth. Well, we have, then you have evangelism. You know what comes after evangelism? Acquiring wisdom, divine wisdom. And, and I, I think the Hebrew was right on top of it. Now, I have no idea how the Septuagint got into that stuff. There's no doubt that the Hebrew text here, and this word is used all over the Old Testament as, as wisdom, like in, in, in Proverbs 1.5. This word is used uh, where, and, and I think it's talking, well, I know it's talking about spiritual growth, but a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. That's what this word means. This is what's going on there. So it makes a sharp, it makes a big difference on how you look at that translation on what this what's going on in this period. Does that make sense to you? And um, so, I, you know, for me, I'm glad I stay with the Hebrew. Uh, that trumps the other for me. The Hebrew, the original text, I'm going to stay with the original text before I leave it, okay? Because I honestly don't know how. They, this, may, this may have some meaning that I don't understand because all I can do, I can, I can translate the Septuagint out of the Greek, but I don't know why they did that. See? Uh, I don't know why they did that. And so it, there, is, there is some confusion on it. There's none in my heart because I go with the original text. So I, I stay with that. Um, in Colossians 129, this idea of choir wisdom we proclaim him and admonish every man and teach every man with all wisdom so that they may present every man complete in Christ. I think that's what was going on. I think that's why that name is important. It sets out a specific period, evangelism, spiritual growth, maturity. And uh, that uh, wisdom, divine wisdom, is a sign of spiritual maturity. I guess you all know that. Then the, the final word that to get us to the five is an interesting word. See the E-L on the end of that word? That's God. 
Mahala, Mahalaleel, the word El is God, the rest of that is the word praise. It's the word praise. And, and, and it has a preposition on the front. The word praise is, is the H-A-L-A, H-A-L-A-L, that's the word praise. And the, they put a preposition on the front of that, and, and it, it, it expands this idea, and this word is translated praise God. It, it, it translates the ability that, that you have reached a place in your life where you can praise God no matter what the circumstances of life. So what they did with this, that, that M on the front of this word is actually a preposition because the word praise is H-A-L-A-L. -A -A and so and then you have E-L as far as roots when you take this word down and break it down. And so this makes this a very interesting... Now, when the Septuagint in verse 20, in, in Luke 3, 37, when the Septuagint did it, it, they 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 kept it close enough for us to stay with it, okay? They translated that just about as well as they could translate that word, uh, and you can see they spelled it M A L A L L E E L, and actually that is the way it is written, and they wrote it actually out that way, and in the Hebrew, they that extra e, that extra e in there. That's a shawa. That's a shawa. It, it wasn't necessary to write it out. You know, it's one of those shawas that sometimes you use it as an E and sometimes you just use it as a writer. So that's what they did. So there's no problem with that. If it looks a little different, that's okay. But what's interesting to me, you have the same genealogy in First Chronicles 1, 1 through 4. The same genealogy that's in Genesis 5 you have in 1 Chronicles. So when you're researching, look it up. So I went back and I took a look at these names, and they're identical to what we have in Genesis 5. In other words, 1 Chronicles took them right out of Genesis 5 just the way they were written. So for me, that's, that's how you back it up. That's how you back all this up. Uh, now, Look, I think we got something going here in the early in the early antediluvian period. We've got evangelism. We've got spiritual growth, maturity. People are, are working their lives out of divine wisdom. And we've got true worship going on. We've got true worship. People have the wisdom to be able to worship God no matter what the circumstance. You know, true wisdom is the ability to praise God and worship him no matter what your circumstances of life are. A great they don't dictate how I, I feel about God, how I worship him. And so I think that's what we have going on in one, two, three, four, and 5. The first five generations were moving really well. Okay? Then we come to the second half of this, uh, the last five, which really heats up. The angelic conflict. You can see in the last five generations, the angelic conflict is really heated up. Really heated up. Uh, and we'll note some things. Watch for uh, certification changes. Watch for key grammatical changes that I will point out. Watch for special phrases and for prophetic revelations. Watch for these. Now, Jared is really interesting because we there there is no doubt that most theologians that have studied this believe that Jared was the generation because his name means means descent and we believe that's when the the fallen angels cohabited with the daughters of men and produced this superhuman race called the Nephilim that brought the the flood on the world you can what We'll read about some of this, but not tonight. All right? Now, in the Apocrypha book of Enoch, it didn't make our canonization, but Jude and Peter both quoted from it. 
they saw some significance in quoting from it. In the book of Enoch, that this is what we call the first book of Enoch, because others have been written that ain't worth messing with. But the first book of Enoch, it's, it's in our, our library upstairs. I, I purchased that book. I was able to get a hold of it. I put it in the library. I have no where the library because anyhow. Um, it's a book well worth reading. Now, the first, you want to only get the first of the book translation, but the book of Enoch places this time when the fallen angels descended and resulted in the Nephilim, right? They, 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 they lay it out. Peter, Peter, Second Peter quotes from the book, and so does Jude. For example, in uh, Jude, let's go to Jude a moment. Let me show you that. Jude's famous for this. And everybody knows this. I mean, I'm not telling you any, anything that students of the Bible know, don't know. They, they all know this. Um, verse 6. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He's talking about these fallen angels. He has kept in eternal bond under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Okay? Then verses 14 and 15, I'm just giving you an idea about it. He goes to Enoch, the seventh from Adam. The seventh Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes, came, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all of the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in ungodly ways and of all the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay? And he's using a comparison. Jude is using a comparison out of that to the post-Diluvian. Second Peter refers to it. You can. These angels are discussed in Revelation 9-11 because... After they were put in the in uh, Tatars, the uh, prison of fallen angels, um, it's discussed in First Peter, the third chapter, verses nineteen and twenty. And um, in Genesis, the sixth chapter, when this is discussed, which is still part of our Toledoth too, by the way, in the sixth chapter, verse verses two through four, it talks about this. Back to Genesis. Now it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land, the daughters daughters were born to them, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, uh, whomever they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilims were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, if you have a study Bible, you're going to see that they're going to go into a discussion on this with you. They will go into a pretty hefty decision, at least mine did, a pretty hefty decision. And they're going to talk about this prophecy right here, mentioned out of Jude 14 and 15. And they're going to identify this also, uh, with the apocalyptic book of Enoch. Are you with me? If you have a study Bible, they're going to clue you in on these things. But this is where, this is that period. And both in the book of Genesis, as well as Second Peter and Jude, they all believe, they all believe that. And the one outside source uh, is the book of Enoch. Now, and so now we got, we got stuff really stirring here, haven't we? Now we got stuff really stirring. We had everything going really good, evangelism, spiritual growth, uh, people praising God in a proper way. We had spiritual mature, and then all of a sudden, boy, I mean, we, we, are, we are in the thick of the angelic conflict. Then we have Enoch. His, his name means dedication. We're in, now we're in Genesis 5, 21 through 24. Now here's what's important. I want to tell you this because nobody's paying attention to me at this point, but listen. We went from three verses on identity of people. 
we had a we had a birth certificate, we had a genealogy certificate, and we had a dead dead certificate, and we were done. All five of the first five have been that way. Uh, Japheth has been that way. With now, listen to me now. This is important. When we get to Enoch, we got four. There are four verses. 21, 22, 23, and 24. We got four verses. As soon as you run into that as a, as a, as a student of the Word of God, you go, whoa, wait. We've lost our, our formula. There, uh, the formula somehow has been changed. So when you go to the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 24, we've got four verses, four verses with Enoch. Now, we know Enoch's, this is a big deal with Enoch, right? I mean, he wasn't, he, he was not, and he was translated and all that. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. Never have seen that before. This is a whole new phrase. Not only that, this word, there are only two men in that whole, that whole civilization that walked with God that this term is to give to, he and Noah. Only two men that walked with God was Enoch and, and Noah. As given that description. In the Hebrew... That's a hifpael. When it says walked, that's halak in the hifpael. Now, we haven't got to that yet, but we'll be there this next semester. The hifpael is really important because let me tell you what a hifpael, that's intensive reflexive. This intense means this is what we're, when we use this, when we put the hifpael in there, we're talking about something that's really intense. That, that's why it's called an intensive. It's intense. Something is really heating up. And they, they have a way of saying that in Hebrew. And it's reflexive, which means it's reflecting back on the person. It's reflecting. It's, it's, we, in the Greek, we call it a middle voice. And, and, and he himself, in the English, he himself. Or he alone. He walked with God when no one else was willing to walk. Same true with Noah. When it says Noah walked with God, it does the same thing. It, and it means that he walked when, when it wasn't popular to walk with God. Oh, it was popular to talk, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't popular to walk. Are you with me? That's really important. That's... That's really important, and he's going to do it again with Noah in the 6th chapter, verse 9. So we got four verses and a good reason because we've got a phrase stuck in here in, in uh, um, this um, uh, part. Verse 22, Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. In other words, there was already a lot of chaos going on, right? From the daughters of the men and all this pollution, the spiritual pollution going on and apostasy. Enoch comes along. He's going to walk with God. And listen, he's the lone ranger. He is the lone ranger out there. There are not many willing to walk with him because of the apostasy going on. And so, and, and he says something here. This is really important because of Methuselah. He says he walked, he walked alone for God. Now he may not have been the only knee, but he was the only one that was visible out there. The other people may have talked about God in a whisper or in a cave. But he was the only guy out doing it public. All right. This guy walked with God. When it says walk, that's a that's a uh, anthropomorphism of of a term that everybody would understand. You say, well, boy, Enoch walks with God. That's a public idea. And listen, it says, and this is important, 300, he walked, for, he walked with God 300 years after Methuselah was born. Now, that's going to be important in a moment. Um, so we, under, under Enoch, we have that. Um, the word... And listen, the word which is in every other, every other uh, genealogy, the word is lived, not walked. They lived, not walked. He's called walked, not lived. He's not described as all the other genealogies. 
as lived. His living was walking for God in an apostate time of life. All right? That's important. That's important because there is a disruption in the format of the history of this genealogy. There's another phrase that's attached to him that's not attached to anybody else. And it's the second phrase is, and was not, for God took him. In the book of Hebrews, Enoch is discussed in this very way in Hebrews 11, chapter, verses 5 and 6. We see, we see this, and this, this description of Enoch comes right out of our passage, and it comes out of this idea, okay? Also, because he was taken, there's no death certificate. You read that, there's no death certificate. Okay? So th there's been, God has made an enormous statement in the seventh generation of ten about the history. Now we get to Methuselah. He's probably the most well-known guy because he lived so long. Every kid, you know, what kid doesn't go through is, you know, about Methuselah. In fact, out at camp one year, I did, I did him because I just felt kids would know about Methuselah. If they didn't, they ought to know he was the oldest man, and I was close to his age <laughs> in, in dog years, in dog years. Uh, but here's what's interesting. Na names are important. Are you ready? Names are important. Here's what his name means. His name means when he dies... It will be sent. That's what his name means. I'm going to tell you something now. When he died, the flood came. This guy lived till the flood came. That's why he's the oldest man. Do you know why he's the oldest man? Because of 2 Peter 3 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but they all should come to repentance. That's the God that we have as our Father. That's why he's the oldest man. Not because he, ate, not because he took vitamins. <laughs> Although he may have, and it might have helped him have quality of life. He lived because God is the one who sets the time. Remember, we've talked about that. He sets your days, your months, your years. No man can pass the fixed limit. So, Methuselah is a really interesting guy. His name is the prophetic time of the flood judgment. He is the oldest man of human history, I think, based on 2 Peter 3.9. By the way, do you know that 2 Peter 3.9 is in the middle of a discussion on how the antediluvian world was destroyed by, by a flood and in the middle of a discussion on how the post-diluvian world is going to be destroyed by fire? I know, no, people don't put any penny to they quote scripture and don't pay any attention to where it's at, but whew, that's a good one. That is a good one. That is a good one. He dies, and you, if you're a math guy, you can go in here and you can run your numbers and you can find this. You can, you can look at this two or three different ways as guys have done with me in the School of Biblical Theology. The year he died, the flood came upon the antelope world in what's called the 600th year of Noah's life. The Bible has a great deal. I had a professor in college that, that did, thought that the flood of Noah was um, a myth. I said, well, boy, a whole lot of people historically bought into that myth. Because it's recorded in, in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Second Peter, the book of First Peter, and Matthew. Jesus even said it. Well, there whole bunch of us you know how hard it is to stay focused and get it and try to get an A in a class like that <laughs> because you're reminded you know why you're here to get a degree and get out of here so just in case you get a teacher like that sometime now Lamech Lamech 
also, watch this, four verses. Lamech, four verses. What's that tell you? Something's up. Agree? Four verses. Something's up. Four verses, not three. His name means conqueror. And boy, did the, did the, did the devil do a number. The special phrase with prophecy, listen, you always pay attention to the names and what's going on. Like Noah's a word for rest. Now watch. This is Noah's dad. Watch this. Now he, his, his son is firstborn. Now he calls his name Noah. His, and listen to the prophecy. Saying, this one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord had cursed. Ara, we're going all the way back to Genesis 3rd chapter 14 through 19. And in the New Testament, we're going all the way up to Romans 8. Now he's setting us up for Noah and the, and the time of the flood. Now, to Noah, what is Methuselah to Noah? His grandfather. So, it's possible for your grandfather to be around through a lot of your activities in life before he dies, right? This, this old man's going to hang on and hang on and hang on. He's outliving, outliving everybody. You know why? 2 Peter 3, 9. And, and you know what Noah's name means? That God's going to bring rest to all this turmoil. It's going to bring judgment. It's going to, listen, the judgment on the world is going to bring rest to the believer. That's what the second coming of Christ is going to do, isn't it? See, we, we have a good picture of what that means in the second coming of Christ, which we sometimes have difficulty with the other, like this. Noah. Look at Noah. One verse. <laughs> One verse. One verse. One certificate. And it's different than any of the other birth certificates. Three sons are named. Not one. Not the firstborn. All three of them. And that's all we get about him until we get into the Toledoth 3. And then we discover that he lived to be 950 years. We won't get a death certificate until Toledoth 3. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. See, everybody starts talking about the flood and date and everything connected to it. You see that? They might have said 300 years before Methuselah, but we know Methuselah means flood. Well, anyhow. You know, in closing, you know God is in control of human history. Do you believe that? Then believe this. He's in control of your human history. Then believe that. See, it's easy to say, well, I believe God is in control of human history. And then you fall apart when, it, when he drops in on yours. Listen, when you're going to say that, make sure that you got a mirror to come back to. Let me tell you. Well, anyhow, that gives you a look at that aspect. Let me close in a word of prayer and we'll let the internet be dismissed and we'll do our moment of time of family prayer here. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come and sat so attentively through our study. I pray that be true with those at home. They're going to have to do a lot of study on their own because in one hour I just went through a whole lot of stuff. And uh, if they have access to get the, the notes, and I know John has them for those on the internet, I would encourage you to get all the notes and go through that on our website. You can go into a lot more detail. There's a lot of information on this subject matter. But we thank you, Father, for the freedom we have to assemble tonight here in America, in this church. Thank you for each person that's come our way to study with us because they have an appetite for the truth. And I pray, Father, we fed some. We fed all some. 
And so we're thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen.